Hello and welcome back. So today I want to talk about inductors and in particular what I'm interested in is looking at how the inductor's construction influences the magnetic field around the inductor. So basically what I want to do is look at multiple inductors, multiple construction type inductors and see how the way they are built influences their magnetic emissions. So if you're curious then keep watching. So normally when you use an inductor in a circuit, for example in a switch mode power supply, you will have a very high ripple current going through it. So the current will be constantly varying up and down. And all this varying current will create magnetic fields. And normally what you want with your inductor is to keep all the magnetic fields inside the inductor. You don't want them spreading out and you don't want them influencing other circuitry, so nearby sensitive signal lines or you don't want them affecting your compliance testing. So for today's experiments, I will be using similar size inductors, all of them 10 microhenry, but each of them will have some sort of different construction characteristic. And in particular, what I want to see is how this construction influences the way in which the magnetic flux is closed into the inductor and which construction type really lets all the flux go out. Now, before starting the actual measurements, first I want to say a few words about the setup that I will be using. Now, normally you can measure the emissions from an inductor using a magnetic field probe, so just like the one that I've built a few videos ago. But the problem with this method is that, well, the magnetic field probe and the inductor will always be in different positions, so it's very difficult to obtain a repeatable setup. So to that end, I've built this thing. So what I have here is an inductor that's built exactly like the magnetic field probe. So there are a few turns here, but there's also an electrical shield around it. And then my test inductor, so the one that will be emitting the magnetic fields, is placed right in the middle. So I've put a little socket in there, and then my test inductors are all soldered with some pins, so I can swap them in and out and have a repeatable setup. Other than that, the board just contains two BNC connectors. So one of these is connected to my test inductor and the other is connected to my measurement inductor. So one of these will go to the power amplifier, which is supplied from a signal generator, and the other will go into the oscilloscope to measure the response. Now, if we were to look at this setup from a simulation point of view, this is what it would look like. So I will be using a 500 kilohertz signal coming from a signal generator, one volt peak to peak amplitude. I'm supplying my test inductor, 10 microhenry in all cases, through a 10 ohm resistor. This resistor will help to reduce any sort of excess currents or any sort of oscillations to occur. And my test inductor is coupled to my magnetic field probe, which has 1.9 microhenries based on the number of turns and its size. So this is a calculated value. And this inductor is connected to the oscilloscope onto a 75 ohm termination. This will help reduce any background noise and so on. And now even though the inductance ratio will always be roughly the same, so neither of the inductors will change their value that much, the thing that will affect how much signal we get on the oscilloscope side is dependent on how well the two inductors are coupled together. So if we run the simulation, here I have a transformer created between these two inductors, but the coupling factor varies between 1 and 0.01 at the rate of 3 points per decade. And we can see our input signal, the one volt, well actually it's two volts peak to peak. And on the inductor side we get slightly smaller value, this is because of the resistor. And then on the other side we have completely different values. So based on the coupling factor we can have a maximum of 400, I mean 800 peak to peak, and we can go as low as zero. So if there would be absolutely no coupling between the two inductors, the voltage on the secondary side will be zero. Now in practice, we won't get these two extremes. Neither will we get the 400 millivolts, nor the zero. We'll have some in-between values. Now there's one more setup related issue that I want to mention. So this will be the setup that I will be using. I got my oscilloscope. So the first channel will be connected to the magnetic field probe. So the receiving inductor. And the second channel will be just a monitor to see the signal coming from the signal generator. Now, 
As is, the oscilloscope is set to an X1 input, we see the background noise, so we have roughly 2-300 microvolts of peak-to-peak -peak noise. But now, when I connect my circuit, so there's no input signal or nothing, we can see that we have quite a bit of background noise increase. So we went from the 300 microvolts to almost 2.5 millivolts of peak-to-peak -peak noise. And since we will be working with very small signal levels, this can be a problem. So to try to reduce the noise that the inductor is picking up from the environment, today marks the return of the cookie box. Basically, what this is, is a shielded enclosure, but that's a fancy name, so we'll be using cookie box. And this is made out of metal, conductive metal, and if I place my circuit into this, so I drilled a couple holes for the two BNC connectors, we can see that this didn't really help a lot, but the reason for that is that the metallic case is not really connected to the circuit, so right now it's still a floating piece of metal, which is not a good thing. But if I connect this to the ground of my receiving probe, our noise goes down by quite a substantial amount. Now, I will be soldering this in a moment, but for now, we can see that by using a shielded enclosure on top of our circuit, we can eliminate most of the background noise. So it's not perfect, the ceiling is not really perfect with the box, but it's far better than just working with an exposed circuit. This will provide quite a lot of immunity to external noise sources. So let's start things off with the unshielded open magnetic path inductor, the one that is supposed to be the worst. So I'm applying my approximately one volt peak to peak signal and if I now introduce my inductor and also add shielding case, while well, we can see the responses of the chart, so if I adjust the scale a bit, we can see that with our first inductor, we have around 17 millivolts of peak to peak signal being transmitted to the secondary coil. Now, to get a better understanding of why this inductor is supposed to be the worst, I also made some cross-section cuts through one of each of these inductors that I'll be testing today. And if we look at this particular inductor, we can see that the way it's built, it's basically a drum shape or a bobbin shape, I don't know what's the correct term for it, and there's just wire wound around it. And basically the magnetic field lines that go through the inductor go through this ferrite core in the middle, and then just close around in the air around it. So you have a very clear path for the magnetic field lines inside of the inductor, but once you get to the end of the ferrite piece, then it just goes everywhere. So that's why we're getting such a large response from this inductor. So basically, to make things better, what you need is an extra piece of ferrite, something that will take all these magnetic field lines that go outside of the coil and try to keep them inside. So the next inductor that I will try out is this shielded type. So this is basically the same thing as before. We have our bobbin shape in the middle with the wire around it, but then we also have this extra ring of ferrite around it. And now if we place this inside, we can already see that we have a far better response. So we went from the 17 millivolts down to around seven millivolts, six point something, but it's very close to seven. Now again, if we look at the cross section of this inductor, we can see the bobbin structure in the middle, we can see the ring on the outside, but what we can also see is that there's an air gap in between the two. So the two pieces of ferrite aren't really touching each other, so we can see this also when we look at the inductor from the outside. So we have this air gap where the magnetic field lines again end up spreading out all over the place. So although this structure is far better, it's not good enough. So the next inductor that I want to look at has a very similar structure to this one. It has the bobbin in the middle, it has the ring on the outside, but if you look at it, you can't really see the windings. I mean, if you look at them from the bottom side, you can still see the windings, but from the top side, the windings are no longer visible. And that's because this sort of inductor also has an extra element added and that is a ferrite resin. So you have this black muck put over it, 
which is supposed to be conducting the magnetic fields. And we can see that it's not perfect, but we went down a bit. So we went from the 6.7 millivolts down to about 5 point something. So this resin is helping, but it's not perfect. We can also see this in the cross section that although the resin has been applied, there are still gaps in the structure and there are still ways in which the magnetic field lines can escape. Before moving on, since we're on the subject of this magnetic resin thing, there's one more type of inductor that I want to look at, and that's basically the same inductor we started off with, so we have the bobbin, but rather than just putting a ring on top and adding the resin, they just added the resin and forgot about the ring. So this again is quite a common type of inductor. You can see this resin being applied all over it. And if we try this out, well, it's not that great. So we're back up to around 14 millivolts, just slightly lower than the 17 we started off with. So this just goes to show that this magnetic resin thing is useful, but it's not perfect. And there are multiple reasons why we have such a poor result with this. So first of all, if we look into the cross section, we can see that the extra resin that has been added is quite a thin layer. So there's not much resin compared to how much ferrite is in the core of the inductor. And another issue is that, at least for this part, it's perfectly normal to have gaps in the resin. So we can see them on the actual part that I'm testing, but we can also see this in the datasheet. So the manufacturer is specifying that it's perfectly normal to have gaps in this thing. Now you could choose other inductors that have better performance, but for this particular model that I'm using, it, it's not that great. So there's one final inductor type I want to look at, and that is the powder iron core. This is supposed to be the best. Let's have a look. Well, we can already see it's a completely different story with this one. So now we're actually taking advantage of our shielding box. And we can see that we barely have a couple millivolts of induced signal. So this is the inductor that has the best performance of the ones that I looked at today. And the reason why this is performing so well can again be seen if we look into the cross section. So what we see here, we see our turns on the sides, but we can also see that the magnetically conductive material, so in this case it's the powder core, it's all around the inductor. There's no more air gaps, no more, no more multiple components added together. It's a single solid mass and it encases the inductor completely. So even with this inductor, you still have some field lines escaping it, but this time most of the magnetic field is concentrated inside into the inductor. But all in all, if you're having emissions problems and you suspect your switching supply or some other circuit that uses an inductor, a good place to start looking for a solution would be the inductor itself. So if you actually have problems from this sort of sources, it's a very good idea to look at exactly how the inductor is built and to see if there's anything that can be done about that to reduce your emissions. But for now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and see you next time. Bye bye.